This is Tommy's Outdoors 87, and this is the first episode of the podcast in the year 2021. Everybody is looking forward to 2021, as this year is supposed to be much better than 2020 was. Well, that remains to be seen, but anyway, our guest today is Porig Huli from Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. And we start obviously talking about what Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is, what they do, how it started. And then we switch gear and we dive deep into the whole host of cetacean-related subjects. Firstly, we discuss cetacean species that can be found in our waters. We discuss uh, my personal favorite, which is cetaceans evolution, how it happened that the land-based animal became so adapted to marine wild to marine uh, environment. And then we talk about uh, whale watching, and not only whale watching from the boat, but uh, specifically whale watching from the shore. We discuss when, where, how, uh, what equipment do you need, what technique do you need to uh, apply to actually find, uh, you know, some some to, to to have some sightings at a quite a distance. That's a very interesting subject. And also we discuss strandings, uh, why they're happening, what can be done uh, if the stranding happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously we discussed all other uh, subjects that are, uh, you know, too numerous to uh, give you here because that introduction will be just too long. And uh, as usual, before I let you enjoy this episode of podcast, uh, just a reminder that the video version of this podcast is available on. Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel and you will find on this channel all episodes of the podcast and lots of more of uh, interesting educational outdoorsy stuff so go to YouTube and find Tommy's Outdoors and subscribe on YouTube to Tommy's Outdoors and uh, with that out of the way ladies and gentlemen Porig, Huli and Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. So good to be here. Good to have you. Uh, Porek, you are a sightings officer in Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. And I want to make a podcast with, uh, with you guys for a long time. So it's, it's a really p- pleasure that you find some time to, to be on the, on the show. Um, listen, maybe just to set up the scene for, for our listeners and viewers, um, tell us what Irish uh, Whale and Dolphin Group is how it started and how it started for you, how you got involved, just to set out the scene so, so we all know. Well, yeah, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group was founded back, uh, back in 19, 1989, 1990. Uh, and basically we were just, a, if you like, a broad church of people who were fascinated uh, with marine wildlife and the, the, the ocean and, uh, and you know, the animals, not only whales and dolphins, but sharks as well and mm-hmm. uh, all creatures in the sea. And th- there had been no organisation in Ireland up to that point uh, that was dedicated to the study and conservation of, uh, of cetaceans, which are mm-hmm. whales, dolphins and porpoises. So if you like, the origins of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group date back to around 1990, where the group was born, if you like, out of the Department of Zoology in in. UCC oh. University College Cork. Wow! So, so it is like a fir- firmly uh, rooted in scientific uh, endeavor and 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 a scientific research. Yeah, I, I mean, we are largely, if you like, um, uh, you know. Science, if you like, underpins the work of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, uh, and 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 that is actually really really important to us. Um, so yeah, but you know, as I said, we're we're a broad church. I mean, strictly speaking, uh, my my background, strictly speaking, isn't necessarily a scientific background. Uh, I I come from a more corporate background, as do many of the officers within IWDG. But the one thing that actually keeps us together, holds us together, is that uh, the common thread is our our passion for for, for whales and dolphins and whale watching and whale conservation. But yeah, obviously the, the science is central to what we do. Right, right. And so are you running like a scientific project and gathering data that then is 
uh, you know, available for the scientists or, or you, you guys are doing certain research yourself and publishing papers? Like how, the, how does it work? Are, are you running? Because I presume this is much more sophisticated than just, you know, walking around and with a binos and, and spotting whales. Yeah, well, sometimes it's the very simple things, uh, you know, and the, the core work of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group uh, are the two schemes which we run, which are the sighting scheme and the stranding scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to be the sightings officer. Uh, so my job, for instance, is to, uh, is to log and validate all cetacean sighting records from uh, from from Irish waters. My colleague Mick O'Connell, uh, who's uh, due, due to step down, I think this week uh, after many many years, but his job is to record strandings of uh, of animals that wash up dead uh, or that are dying on our beaches. So they're kind of, if you like, two flip sides to the coin. Uh, and that might sound very unscientific, uh, but what it actually does is it, it gives us the big picture. Mm -hmm. And the big picture is really important because without the big picture, you don't get the small pictures. You don't get, yeah. you don't get to, to, to ask, hmm, well, what's happening over there? Or why is this happening over here? Or what the hell is happening in Donegal? Look at West Cork. Jeez, there's something strange happening down there. So, so those, that monitoring is critical because what it does is it highlights those areas that would benefit from further, more detailed study. Uh, and that's where the more scientific heads come in within the IWDG or outside of the IWDG. Mm -hmm. But it's that engagement of members of the public, citizen scientists, if you like, uh, oh. and getting them involved and making them feel a part of the recording schemes is really important. Because if it's just down to a couple of scientists or a couple of, you know, zoology or ecology students, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're never going to learn a whole lot. But if we can harness and engage the energy of hundreds or thousands of, yeah. of, of, of whale enthusiasts. Well, that's far more powerful. And it gives us a much better geographic spread of, of information pertaining to these animals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's even quite common that people are walking on the beach and they find a washed up dolphin or, or, or porpoise or, and they're like, oh, what do I do? Like the they feel like they should do something about it. And, and quite often it's like, oh, what do I do? I'm going to call guards or I'm going to, you know, and, and that's, uh, I, I even made a video uh, about, uh, you know, I found a dead dolphin. I kind of made a video, it's on my YouTube channel. And maybe, maybe I'm going to put the card on the, on the screen right now for people who are watching this on YouTube, uh, where then I go to your website and you can record on your website very detailed, uh, well, on one hand, it's very detailed because you can even uh, there. I, I think you can say like how many teeth there is in the in the in the, in, the, in the particular uh, animal, which then I presume helps in identification if there if the carcass is decayed. But then you don't have to do that, and you say I, I think this is what it is, or I have no idea what it is. Here's the picture. Here's what I found it, and you can submit submit that. And uh, I found it's very very useful because quite often people are feeling the need to action, you know, like they find a bird that is injured or they, you know, find a dead dolphin. So, so you kind of harnessing that natural curiosity of people to, to gather the data. And, and so I think it's great. Listen, absolutely. Can... And, and so some people think, Tommy, that, oh, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of just academic, you know, well, what the hell do these guys want to know how, how many teeth there are? Well, as you say, if an animal is very decayed, the numbers of teeth can help us identify the species. Because, for instance, you know, pilot whales have generally got, you know, about 12 teeth. Risso's dolphins have generally got about four teeth. Bottlenose dolphins usually about 12. Common dolphins and striped dolphins have 42 to 44 teeth, mm -hmm. uh, assuming none of them have been knocked out, of course. So, so although it might seem like a huge amount of detail, uh, for us it's all about validation. Uh, and as we say, we validate because we care, because getting the information, getting the general information, like what species is it? That's fundamental to any situation. If you don't know what species you're, you're, you're dealing with, well, then sort of everything else is just kind of, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. not very satisfactory. And many, many years ago when we started this, there were a couple of things that we noticed. And I always noticed, for instance, that on bank holiday weekends, we get an awful lot more sightings of killer whales. Uh -huh. 
So, so one of two things is happening. Either killer whales have an inshore movement that coincides with bank holiday weekends in Ireland, or there's a migration of people who don't really largely know one species from the other. Uh, they migrate to the coast at bank holiday weekends. And every Monday after bank holiday weekends, we get the most fantastical sightings, usually blue whales and killer whales and beluga whales and the likes. Uh, so that is why validation is important because if we just accept what everybody tells us <clears throat> well then what's going to happen is about you know 40 50 percent of our data is going to be inaccurate yeah. and there's the old saying tommy if you put shit into a system you're going to get shit out the system the other side uh, and 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 if we can if, you know we we do this with the data coming in so that we protect we we in effect protect the good data mm -hmm. so we, by getting rid of the bad data you're you're protecting the data that we can stand over because it has gone through a certain amount of rigor and and yeah. and that is important of course nowadays it's quite it, it's becoming easier because of course everybody has a camera in their pocket so uh, in particular with strandings you're walking along a beach all you got to do now is just take a picture of it mm -hmm. uh, and send it to us then you don't have to go sort of on your hands and knees and counting the teeth, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's all good, and we and we do it for a good reason. Yeah, I was uh, I was also uh, you know almost considering to go back to the beach and count the damn teeth of the on that animal. Ah, oh, how could I not think about that and <laughs> count the teeth? Um, listen, uh, you 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 mentioned uh, quite a lot of species of of, of dolphins. Um, we'll get to that. So the question just on the on the data. Is your data set in any way uh, connected with uh, National Biodiversity Data Center? Yeah, they will have tens of thousands of our data. Uh, so, oh. so what, 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 what we do is, what, what the Biodiversity Data Center does is, they, they generally ask people to report sightings directly to them, especially yeah. sightings of, uh, of, of, of plants and bugs and insects and the like. But they have no cetacean experts in the biodiversity. You know, they, they, you know they've yeah. got a, a staff of half a dozen people and they don't happen to have a marine ma mammal uh, ecologist or biologist there. Mm -hmm. so, so, so they've no way of validating those records. So, so they leave it to the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. And in fact, in many ways, uh, the biodiversity data set Center when they were setting up, you know, 15 years ago, you know, they were largely looking at the work of the IWDG and to a certain degree, uh, sort of how we coordinate the sighting scheme. Uh -huh. And no small role in how the National Biodiversity Data Center uh, set up. So uh -huh. we've been one of the uh, one of the, the really big data provider partners, if you like, of the Biodiversity Data Center. So every couple of years, uh, when they're doing, say, the Marine Mammal Atlas of Ireland, they come to us to look for our, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group data set. And of course, there are other data sets as well. But the, the biggest source of data in Ireland for whales and dolphins. Uh, and what we have is we have longevity because, you know, we haven't, you know, there are PhD students going out there and they collect data for two or three years and they get the qualification and then they disappear. They go to Hawaii to study mm -hmm. turtles or they go to, you know, Mauritania. <laughs> Or these wonderfully exotic look, and you tend to lose them very, very quickly uh, because once they get their qualifications, they're gone. You know, to warm climes and very, very sexy animals. Uh, but, but what we have is we have that longevity of the recording schemes. So it's that continuous data set which we have since you know 1989, 1990, uh, and we have historic records as well, which can go back over over the decades and even centuries. But since the IWDG founded, we've got this very long continuous data set which gives us a really good idea of the trends that happen over the decades. Uh, uh, so so it, is, it is important. But that data is, is made available uh, uh, to the Biodiversity Data Centre because they do absolutely fantastic work down there in, in Waterford and they put together fantastic publications. And, of course, when they're putting together publications on mammals, it's really important that they include the cetaceans <laughs> because they represent almost 50% of Ireland's mammals are actually living in the ocean. Uh, and you don't realize that, you know, if you pick up any book on mammals in Ireland, you get rabbits and foxes and badgers and hares and all that. Mm. You, you know, if you include all the cetaceans and the pinnipeds, which are the seals, and maybe throw in the river otter, which is classed as a marine mammal, mm. uh, over almost 50 percent. In fact, is it 50 percent now? Might be 50 percent of Ireland's mammals live in our oceans. Yeah, but it's a fifty percent uh, as in as in species, or is it fifty percent as in yeah. like a number? 
as in species, no, well, obviously there's an awful lot more m- mice and rats out there than there are mm. blue whales and Irish yeah. waters. <laughs> in terms of our species list, the numbers of species, over half of Ireland's mammals are marine mammals. Uh, and, and they're largely underrepresented. If you pick up any mm. book on Ireland's mammal fauna, certainly in the past, there'd be a couple of pages at the back, you know, thrown in, oh, our whales and dolphins. But in fact, our whales and dolphins make up over half of our, 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 our total mammal fauna. So they are a really, really important group of animals. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, probably to, to some proportion of people, uh, dolphins and, and, and whales like, it's like almost a fish. They don't really think about them in the, in the category of, of mammals. <laughs> Listen, um, so just to continue on that thread, are you relying only on the... Um, Uh, people just, you know, who are happen to see dolphin dead on alive, dead on alive or whale, or you're running some sort of a membership scheme, right? You can be, you can, you can become a member of a, a, a Irish whale and dolphin group. Yeah, of, of, of course, yeah. We have a, a growing membership every year. Um, uh, uh, and there are a number of ways that people can, um, people can contribute to the whale and dolphin group scheme. You can just record casual sightings. And a casual sighting, Tommy, is if, you know, you're walking along the beach uh, and you're, you know, or you're, you know, you're going fishing off the, the, the headland and you happen to have an opportunistic sighting of a, of a whale or a dolphin or you're walking along the beach and you happen to, oh gosh, there's a, there's a dead dolphin. Well, they're mm-hmm. casual, if you like, opportunistic sightings or stranding events. You know, you didn't go out in, with the intention of looking for animals, but we, we have what we call the constant effort sighting scheme, mm-hmm. which would be for the more, if you like, the more dedicated people who want to be more systematic about how they 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 search for their animals. Um, so these are people generally with a bit of free time in their hands, people who are flexible and who can get to a local headland. Usually it's a headland. Uh, people who have good optics, like uh, good binoculars or a good uh, spotting scope. Mm-hmm. And these are people who commit to watching, doing a regular watch. And it might only be one watch a month, but the important thing is that it's every month. Uh, now, mm-hmm. undoubtedly, during autumn and winter months, there are periods when the weather can be quite inclement and you might struggle to get out. But, you know, when they can, at l- try and get out at least once a month in, in all seasons. And that's really important because it means that you're removing the bias. And often we find mm-hmm. there's a huge bias in terms of using the casual sightings that members of the public, because we're going to get... Probably bank holiday two, weekends. Bank holiday weekends, exactly. Yeah, we're, we're going to get most of our sightings during those periods of time, bank holiday weekends, or over the summer months when people are spending more time by the sea, on the sea, and in the sea. And that creates a, a huge, you know, between sort of the June bank holiday weekend and sort of, the, and say, Halloween uh, just passed, you know, we'll get most of our sightings. But does that mean there's nothing out there, you know, November, December, January, February, March, April? No, not at all. There's plenty out there still, even in the depths of winter. And it's these teams of, of effort watchers who are going out doing systematic land-based watches uh, in all seasons. They, they're the real, if you like, they're the real unsung heroes uh, who go out uh, regularly in all seasons, not just when it's nice and sunny and the sea is flat calm type thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's giving us the all important big, big, you know, the bigger picture. And it's give, giving us that coverage around the island of Ireland. And also then there's dedicated surveys that we um that mm-hmm. that we do and and some of these are surveys that we do ourselves others are surveys we we would do say on on behalf of the likes of the national parks and wildlife service <clears throat> If they wanted a survey, say, for bottlenose dolphins or for harbour porpoises, recently they did harbour porpoise surveys mm-hmm. uh, car- carried out in the likes of Roaring Water Bay, and they contracted the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group to carry out these dedicated line transect surveys. So there's lots of ways that the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group uh, can, can learn more about whales and dolphins yeah. in, Irish, yeah. in Irish waters. And so these people are all volunteers, right? So are there, is it, is it like, is there a the process of actually becoming a member or is it just like you know as long as you're submitting your sightings regularly enough eventually we're gonna treat you as a member no i mean there's a membership form on our website i oh. 
www.ireland.ie. So it's one of the first things you'll see on our website, you know, support us, become a member. And, you know, lots of our members don't carry out regular watches, you know. Uh, lots of our members just support us because they like the work that we do okay. uh, and they feel it's it's important. Uh, they, you know, you know, but plenty of them do take part. They join us on the Celtic Mist, which is our research yacht. Uh, they come out with us. Uh, they join us on land-based watches. Mm-hmm. They record local stranding events to us. So there's lots of ways that members can help us. But, you know, you know the obvious way is you become a member and you give us a, a few uh, a few euros and you're supporting us in that way if you if they don't want to be actively involved in the actual uh, recording of cetaceans. Gotcha. That's and that's that's I suppose what I was what I was what I was heading into that people can support you financially uh, and the work that you're doing just by becoming a member and that doesn't mean that then they need to necessarily uh, sitting in a December and in, a, in, a, in a, <laughs> some remote place with a, with a binoculars, they can just support you financially. How big is the Irish whales and dolphin group? How, how big organization you um, It yeah, seems I mean, like you're huge. Yeah, it does. We, we often seem like we're the Irish, God, the Irish whale and dolphin group to do an awful lot of work and whales and dolphins are never off the, they're never, you know, really off the news, if you like. Uh, do we, uh, you know, people sometimes think we, we're a huge organisation uh, and we must have a huge corporate structure. I mean, the IWDG, I think, probably has one full-time member. Uh, I, 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 I myself, uh, even though I've been involved in the group now for over 25 years, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an employee. I'm what you'd call a, uh, uh, an independent contractor. Some of us would have, uh, would have temporary contract, uh, uh, you know, contracts with the IWD, IWDG to deliver certain projects. But we're not employees. Or we, we always thought it'd be best to veer away from, you know, us becoming employees. It becomes mm-hmm. a complicated for a small yeah. wildlife charity to have employees so uh, yeah so so we, we there would be so most people who do work for the group do it on a completely voluntary basis yeah and that's that's usually the best the best uh, the best people and who deliver the most work because there's a passion in it right how does it start for you uh, Porik? how did you got involved 25 years that's a long time yeah um I, I, I broke up with my uh, with my then girlfriend many many years ago, and I remember I was coming out from town, being Dublin at the time, out to Greystones, which is my home, and I got I found myself a Bray Dart station, and there was a little A4 poster stuck on the the, the ticket the ticket office, and it said IWDG meeting in. Department of Botany, Zoo, uh, Trinity College, Dublin, and of course. I, I now had free time on my hands uh, and I just had figured out that IWDG meant Wales, Whale and Dolphin Group uh, and that cetaceans meant whales, dolphins and porpoises. Uh, but I, I, I had always been fascinated by whales and dolphins and of course uh, at the time kind of felt that um, that there was potential but I just couldn't really prove it uh, to see these animals in Ireland. But now that there was a group that I had never heard of, I thought well I must go along and join this meeting. So I did and that's where I, I, I I first came across uh, the early names like uh, Simon Barrow and Emo Rogan um, and Brendan Price. These would have been some of the you know the very early players in the group. But I remember hearing uh, our own Simon Barrow speaking and being absolutely fascinated by what he had to say uh, because he had just finished a PhD and uh, down in UCC uh, although his PhD was on was on corvids on crows uh, Mm -hmm. but I could just the passion and energy was just lepping off him Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I I sat in on that meeting and then I just thought yeah you know you feel something you you, you feel it in the pit of your stomach that this this is something that just has uh, yeah there's a there's a lot more inside that you you want to you want to learn and that just morphed for me into uh, I started reading started becoming involved started meeting other people and the energy just grew uh, and then a couple of years later I travelled around the world for a year 1995 1996 um, spent you know three months working on killer on a killer whale project up in British Columbia mm-hmm. uh, Vancouver Island um, uh, travelled down to sort of Fiji New Zealand Australia up to you know but I was basically following whales around the world for 12 months working on projects so I was following on the trail of the whale for a year and of course 
that was a great way for me to cut my teeth, if you like, uh, to, to get that overseas experience. And then when I came back, I, I felt a little bit better equipped with a year of field work behind me uh, to, to really sort of start doing more systematic work here in Ireland. Um, I moved down to Cork back in 1999. Uh, I, I spent four years out at the old Hedekin sale, uh, armed with nothing more than uh, my binoculars, a spotting scope, and a tripod, and I started watching. I started recording mm -hmm. systematically what I was seeing, and uh, that, frankly, changed my life. It was, it, it was a life-changing moment. I remember the first watch I did out at the old Hedekin sale, um, I saw a couple of harbour porpoises, mm -hmm. and I just thought, oh, God, that, that that's kind of rubbish. To be honest, I could have seen those harbour porpoises from Brayhead or from Hothead in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Dublin or Wicklow. About a week later, there was a nice bit of high pressure, calm seas, and I said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give the old Hedekin sail another try. And I counted 149 consecutive blows. Wow. The, these big, enormous vapor plumes. And I, I, I knew they were large whales. I didn't know what species of whale they were. Mm -hmm. And I counted, I kept counting huge numbers of these consecutive blows. And I was saying, well, Jesus, 149 whales, that can't be possible. That's probably more, more if there were fin whales, more fin whales than there's ever been in Ireland. So, mm -hmm. uh, But then I realized what was happening was that you had a group of whales. And as the first whale blew, the second whale blew, the third uh -huh. whale blew. And after about, I kept getting the number 19, there'd be a pause. And then the cycle would start uh -huh. all over again. So I realized what was happening was that it wasn't a continuous spectrum of blows. It was a cycle of blows, but there was a gap. And that gap was around 19 or 20. So I realized after watching these animals for, for about a half an hour that I had about 20 whales. I was pretty sure they were fin whales. And subsequently, yeah, you'd have to say they were fin whales. Mm -hmm. These were the second largest creatures of the planet. And here they were about 15, maybe 20 kilometers southeast of the old Hedekin sail, the largest animals on the planet, second only to the blue whale. Mm -hmm. And here were more than a dozen of them. And that moment had me hooked. I, I, I knew I was in trouble from that point on. <laughs> uh, I... I, I uh, Pretty soon after that, sort of, uh, I just dedicated my, 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 certainly the next dozen years to sitting on headlands and being out on boats watching whales. Because to me, having whale washed already around the world and worked with whales around the world for mm -hmm. a year, I had never seen anything like this. Ha! Huh. So, so that was like all that travel around the world and then you come back home and you have this, this, this amazing sighting. So that's, that's amazing. Incredible. And you know what's more incredible is not just you have a once-off sighting, but, and this is the value of monitoring, on, you know, around the same time the following year, you began to see the, the same things happening, the same species coming in around the same time. And you begin to think, hmm, was that a fluke? No yeah. pun intended. Uh, was that just a chance encounter? Uh, and then year to, I always say, if you see something once, it's good luck. If you see something twice, it's potentially just, you know, chance. But if you see the same thing sort of on the third year, well, then that's a trend. Yeah. And it's watching these trends, watching these sort of species coming in at the same time every year and going at the same time every year. And of course, now, you know, 20 years, 25 years later, we've got much more detail. Now we're, we're not just looking at species, but we're looking at individuals, say with humpback whales. Uh, we're, you know, we're now looking at individuals that we recognize. So it's all about the resolution. You know, we're, we're now looking at these animals uh, in, in a much, much finer scale. Uh, and, and that's just because of the amount of data that we have coming in. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful opportunity. I always say to people, what we have here in our waters is is actually one of the best wildlife shows on the planet and it's on our doorstep and it's free okay you might need to invest in a in, in decent optics to see it properly but you know um it, it, it's a great investment and you know certainly you know we live in a country where you know yourself tommy you, you you're from a country which actually still has large terrestrial mammals uh you know we we we, we don't we, we we knocked down all our forests centuries ago we lost our last wolves back in the the foothills of mount lens and Carlo, uh, two or three hundred years ago, uh, our bears have gone since you know since 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 the ice age, uh, you know. But we still have 
you know, the most incredible mammals. Unfortunately, they're all in the sea. Uh, but it, it, it is a wonderful reminder of just how rich and how diverse our wildlife can be if habitats remain somewhat intact. Yes, absolutely. Listen, uh, good. It's a good segue now. Tell, tell us what uh, what optics, what binoculars would you recommend for for whale watching? Uh, if you can, if you can go like a starting, like if I just want to start, and you don't necessarily want to spend thousands and thousands and thousands because the optics can be very expensive. And then if you can progress that into like a intermediate, and then when you're gonna go like full out whale watching and you're, 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 you know, you want it and you can dedicate a lot of money to it. Sure. Uh, I mean, that conversation, Tommy, could be really, really boring for your viewers. So I just say use Google. It's great. It, it'll get you there. But you know what? By, it, the, my rule of Thomas for people is always with optics, go as high end as you can. Spend as much as your budget will allow. This has been my advice to people for many, many years. Uh, you know, if your budget is 150 euros, spend every cent of it. If your budget is 1,500 euros for a pair of binoculars, spend it. You won't regret it. I, I've never met anybody that, that's bumped into me years later and said, Jesus, you know what? I've, I bought a really expensive pair of binoculars like a Zeiss Swarovski, whatever, or a spotting scope. And it was the greatest waste of money ever. I never got anything out of it. Everybody I've ever spoken to who has invested heavily in optics says it was one of the best investments uh, of their lives. Mm. And that's really important because, you know, you, I, I'm buying a new laptop this week or the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is buying me a new laptop this week. And it's state of the art. It's got, you know, it's got a Ryzen CPU. It's got this much RAM. It's got a great hard drive. It's all the rest. In five years' time, it's going to be a piece of crap. Yeah. Uh, you know, the viruses will come in. You know, the application software just won't work. The processor, you know, the battery life will all go uh, pear-shaped. Uh, but at the moment, optics are completely different. Optics actually almost improve with age. In fact, the, the spotting scope that I bought about 20 years ago, it's as good today as it was the day I bought it. And in fact, the the the... If I was to buy that same spotting scope today, it would actually be more expensive. So while technology and gadgets uh, depreciate, optics appreciate in value. So look after your binoculars. Buy as high end as you can. Uh, for whale watching, for serious whale watching, folks, you really need the benefit of a scope on a steady tripod yeah. because a lot of the time it's not so much that the animals are on the surface for a brief period of time. Generally, Bigger animals are further out to sea. And you can have the best pair of binoculars in the world. You can have a, 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 a thousand, two thousand, even a two and a half grand pair of is the latest Swarovskis. And if those animals are 15, 20 kilometers offshore, you're really not going to see them. So you're going to be missing out on a lot of the big picture. So the advice is always to buy as high end as, 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 the, budget will, as the budget will allow. Um, also, when you walk into an optics sh uh, shop or a camera shop, as a wildlife watcher, Tommy, I know you're a hunter, so obviously you know, you know a bit about optics. Uh, and if you get a sales rep who starts talking to you about magnification, these are so powerful, look at these, are really, really powerful, walk out of the shop. He doesn't know. He or she don't know what they're talking about. They, they've never actually used these, these binoculars in the field. It's not about magnification. In fact, most of the, most of the, the really expensive binoculars uh, tend to have much lighter magnification. But the reason they cost thousands of euros is because of their build quality. It's because of the size of the object lens on them. It's because they're made of glass, not plastic. They're filled with all sorts of gases inside them that, 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 that mean you don't get buildup of condensation and the like. Um, and the problem is I, I can go out and buy for forty nine ninety nine in one of the big retailers a, a, a rubbish pair of binoculars. In a year's time, I'm going to be buying another pair of rubbish binoculars for $49.99 because I'll have thrown them in the bin because the first time I use them in, in poor weather and they get wet, they're going to be useless. They're going to get damp inside. The mold will build up. The condensation will always be a feature. And in 10 years' time, I'll have actually, by the time I've bought 10 pairs of binoculars, you know what? You'd have had really good wildlife viewing if you'd gone out and spent, uh, a, a, you know, 
500 euros on a half decent pair of binoculars and look at all the fun you'd have had in the process. Yes. Uh, so, so don't go cheap. You know, you, you know, you get what you pay for with optics. Uh, so wait, for, you know, if you can't afford them, wait for a maiden aunt to die or that inheritance to come true and, and, and invest in a decent pair of binoculars or a good scope. Mm-hmm. It just changes everything. Yeah, and it's even when you're when you even you put your binos on the on the tripod, it changes the it it changes them uh, because you stab you you establish. And the other and the other thing that that you you mentioned about the magnification, the 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 bigger magnification of the glass that you hunt held, the more difficult it is to see anything because you just got, you just can't hold it steady. So I think that the that the good tip is like. Put them on the uh, on the tripod. Even if you have a binoculars, put them on the tripod. Uh, that will that will stabilize everything. Listen. So, would you go for like an as as big of a uh, as big of a uh, uh, lens as possible to get more light in? Because I presume uh, usually the motivation behind buying the binoculars that are slightly smaller is that they're more portable and you know you know when you're not carrying them around if you if you're walking around but i presume you're not walking around too much and it might be i might be wrong so you can correct me in a second so would you say like big the biggest one because they will have their the biggest the, the best uh, optical properties and then you put them on the on the tripod you put them in a you know steady position and that will give you all the benefits Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's going to depend on what sort of wildlife watching you're doing. And everybody has their own preference. I, I, I just know what works for me. I use a combination when I'm doing a, a land-based whale watch. I use a combination of binoculars. I, well, I, I use three sorts of optics. Mm-hmm. My, my, the best optics I have are these two things in front of my face, my eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, these, these optics uh, give me uh, fantastic, the best peripheral vision uh, and... Uh, You know, fantastic. So when I when I turn up at a whale watch size, uh, I watch for about five or ten minutes. Even before I've sat down, taken anything out of my bag, I'm watching with my eyes because that way I'm going to see anything very, very obvious around. And sometimes you get dolphins at the, at the foot of a cliff top. Sometimes whales are in the bay. They're maybe they're not out 15 kilometers offshore. Sometimes these animals can be in quite close. And the problem with all of, all of a sudden turning up and looking at with your powerful binoculars or putting your telescope scope on your tripod is that sometimes you miss what's much closer to you because obviously the more powerful your optics the closer your field of view is getting okay so so i like to turn up and look for about five or ten minutes with my naked eye Mm -hmm. then i put down my binoculars and i'm scoping or i'm looking with my binoculars panning across to see if there's any areas of obvious activity such as bird activity seabirds gathering uh diving into the water so that's That's it that's the areas of interest That's, it, That's a reason. really important thing that as, as observers of wildlife that we read the cues and, and the seabirds have been doing this for an awful lot longer than we have. They've got much better optics than we'll ever have. Mm-hmm. You know, these, these gannets, shearwaters, gannets have these brilliant eyes for watching shoals of fish. Shearwaters uh, have these brilliant olfactory sense that can actually smell. That's why they, they fly just millimeters above the surface of the ah. water. So they're smelling, they're literally smelling whales and dolphins feeding and farting the emissions of these animals. Uh, so, so if you watch it, it's, listen, whale watching is a bit of a cheat. Really, we're watching seabirds. And more often than not, if, if we're watching seabirds, in about 30 or 40% of cases, the seabirds will deliver us in those areas where we will find whales and dolphins. But, you know, you're right. If you're holding really powerful binoculars, uh, and this is, again, be wary of the sales rep who tries to upsell you on magnification. They become very difficult to hold steady. But you see, when we're whale watching, we're generally whale watching in good weather conditions. You know, there's no point in you going out to a clifftop if it's blowing if it's blowing a gale or even if there's a strong breeze or if it's driving wind and rain. You're not going to see anything Anyway, so whale watching by its nature is quite different to bird watching. Mm-hmm. Bird watchers, especially those bird watchers who, who watch coastal seabirds, they are typically looking for poor weather mm-hmm. because the poor weather pushes the seabirds inshore to, to, to get out of the storms uh, and so that they can find their way along the coast. They need to be able to navigate and 
Putting them within sight of land keeps them out of danger during stormy weather. So if I'm a seabird watcher, I want to watch the, the migrations of seabirds. I'm looking for quite windy conditions because that brings the passengers of seabirds closer to the cliffs within range of me. Whereas if I'm whale watching, I'm looking for the completely opposite. I'm not looking for low pressure. I'm looking for high pressure. I'm not looking for wind and rain. I'm looking for calm. I'm looking for seas that are glass calm. Now, it doesn't happen very often. Often, especially down here in the southwest of Ireland, uh, mm. where our weather is getting windier and windier. But we're looking for very, very certain type of sea conditions, um, high pressure, light seas, calm seas with good visibility, obviously no rain. So the shaking of binoculars really shouldn't be that much of an option. Another problem is when it's foggy. If it's foggy and you're, say, using a, a telescope, well, a telescope, instead of being seven or eight or ten times magnification, a telescope can be um, about... 30 times magnification, or you can even zoom that up to 60 times magnification. So if it's foggy or misty, what you're doing is your magnification, you're, you're magnifying the, the particles of, 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 of mist or dust in the atmosphere. So you're actually, your image is getting even grainier. So strong magnification is great if there's if wind conditions are light or if, if it's clear. But strong magnification can be terrible for your, your viewing conditions if it's windy or, or, or if it's drizzly or misty or foggy because you're, 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 you're only magnifying the bad stuff. And that's no good. Yeah. So op optics, you know, you know, you need to play around with it. You need to find what works for you. But I like that combination of sitting down, watching first with the naked eye so I can get a good overview, then laying down my binoculars to see what I can see in the short to middle distance. By that, I mean one kilometer out to five kilometers. And then if there's nothing there, then I take out the big boy. I take out my spotting scope, stick it on a, on a tripod, and again, there's no point in spending thousands of euros on a, on a powerful scope and then buying a flimsy little tripod mm -hmm. because with a little bit of wind, your tripod is shaking and all you're doing is you're, you're, you're magnifying terribly um, sort of the shake. Uh, yeah. So again... You need to spend a couple of hundred euros on a good Manfrotto tripod or something like that. So, but you know what? Once you've made this investment, that's it. Your investment is over. Uh, enjoy the next 20 or 30 years. Exactly. Amazing wildlife. That's a, that's, a, that's a good point. I want to stress that one more time because often uh, people who are, you know, uh, maybe not have experience with some other expensive gear outside of electronics, they have this thing like, oh, it's like a two years, it's five years, but it's really like, it's decades. You buy it once and it just works for you. Um, listen, so if you're, so you break out, so a couple of interesting things that you're, that you're mentioned. So obviously you're, you're doing visual first without any optics because you have a wider point of view. Then do you prefer, if you're breaking down the, the, the scene with your, with your binos, would you, would you prefer to go kind of horizontal and then go further with each like horizontal pass or, or you do like a prefer to pick up the spot, go as far as you can and then come back and that way cover the, the scene. Is that what you do? Kind of like a breaking down the whole scene with your optics? Well, the, the beautiful thing about using a tripod is like if, say, say I'm using binoculars, the problem with binoculars are, are, are great until you need to go and take a pee or, mm. or your phone rings or you want to go and have a cigarette or something. I don't smoke, by the way. But say, say you get interrupted uh, and you've had your conversation or you've taken your pee and then you go, Oh, geez, where, where was I? Where um, was I? Mm. Oh, oh, and you've lost your place. You can't, oh, crikey, was I over here or was I, oh, geez. With a tripod, you don't have that problem. Once your optics, and in my case, a scope is on a tripod, you've got continuous, you be distracted, and you simply bring your eye back down to your tripod and uh, or back to your eyepiece, and you just continue. And what I like to do is I like to try uh, just a continuous scan. And for me, if I'm scanning from one end, say, down the south coast, so I'm scanning from my western horizon across to my eastern horizon and it's a continuous scan slow scan slowly meticulously until i see something record what i see record the time record the species the number of animals and then i continue panning and the advantage of my continuously panning from right to left or from left to right is that i don't overcount 
I go, I don't double count the same animals, and that's kind of important. Whereas if if I'm with my binoculars, I'm looking here and I'm having a chat with somebody, I'm going back looking again, I'm recording everything. Half the time you're recording the same animals. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you do it in a continuous sweep from one horizon to the other, the chances of your picking up the same animals again, because you know you're you're scanning with your scope a lot faster than those animals are traveling. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're, you're not going to double count. So you're going to rule out the potential for, for double counting or for overestimating what you're seeing. But, you know, you know, we're all, you know, I remember when I was studying ecology in UCC on very, on day one, they did a simple test with us to, to, to find out were we overestimators or underestimators. And it seems I'm a 20% overestimator. So every time I'm counting, say I count a number of animals and I say, I think there was a hundred common dolphins out there off Galley Head. I, I'll generally write down 80 because I remember <laughs> one, of, one of my lecturers in UCC telling me I was, I, I was, a, I had a mild case of overestimating, but, that's a bit of a fisherman story. We're always overestimating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you should take a test again. Maybe with time, you're uh, less of an estimator. Uh, this is boring. And would you would you uh, scan like left to right? Like would you scan like in the one continuous motion, or you have the opinion that you're kind of almost stopping? You're analyzing what you see in a field of view, and then kind of moving the next like a an air quotes frame and because you know sometimes what i what i heard is like you don't really you're not really able to see that clearly what you see if you continuously moving so do you would you say like it's like a stop and then move and stop and then move and stop and move that way or would you just pan continuously no, no. I, I, I mean, I stop when I, I, I'm panning so I can see something of interest. And then once I see something of interest, I need to concentrate because there's certain information we need. We need to know, first of all, what species are we looking at? Mm. And if you're looking at a whale and it's 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, I mean, at some point, that whale is actually going to be so far away. There's, you know, we, we largely assume all believe that the that the earth is that the earth is round. I know there are probably some people out there who probably believe the earth is flat. But believe it or not, if you're watching an object and it's like 20, 25, 30 kilometers away, well, at some point that whale is going to disappear over the edge of the horizon. And all you're going to be able to, the only cue you're going to have is the, the blow. This vapor plume mm -hmm. is going to appear. So sometimes you need to watch these animals for long periods of time uh, so we can learn species and we can get a good idea of how many animals are out there. So the species and the numbers are critical. And that means stopping. And it might, you, you know, you, you yeah, might- Yeah, but you're, you're talking about like once you, found the, once you found your subject, but when you're only looking for- because you know, if you're if you're like glassing a and maybe it's a it's a specificity because like if you if, if I'm glassing a mountain top, what I was taught is like you stop, you 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 watch carefully what you see. If you don't see anything, you kind of move to the next you know you know yeah. your, your next field of view, and then you watch. So you okay. don't continuously move while you're watching. Is is that how it works with whale watching as well? Well, I, I again, it's down to preferences, but don't forget. The eyepiece that I would recommend to everybody is a wide angle eyepiece, mm. okay? So you can get a very narrow eyepiece, very, very powerful, but you're looking at a little bit of water at one time. Everybody who's interested in whale watching and who buys a scope needs to ma make sure that the eyepiece has a W, W for wide, wide angle. So that means that at any one time, mm -hmm. uh, you're watching an area, if you're panning slowly, you're watching a, a wide area of water, maybe for 10, 20, 30 seconds before your panning slowly takes you out of that area. So you've got, and that is the advantage of using a wide angle and panning slowly. You're watching any one area, not just for a second, but maybe for 10, 20, 30 seconds. So if there's something in there, you have a reasonable chance that you're going to see it. Now, of course, if you finish your, your pan from horizon to horizon and you've seen nothing, but that doesn't mean there's nothing there. You could very easily, don't forget, whales spend, what, 98% of their lives subsurface uh, but there will generally be cues like if you know you, you, you may not see a whale but you know there's a lot you know the mood music is right you're seeing the birds are interested the birds are diving you're seeing lots of dolphin activity maybe you're seeing bluefin tuna maybe you're seeing a few seals in the area so you kind of have a sense that there's whales out there so you do an, a pan number two 
and then you do a third pan. And in my experience, it's actually very rare to see something for the first time on my third pan of the of the of the horizon. Mm -hmm. So usually if it's out there, it'll generally reveal itself after one or two pans. So if I've watched three pans and maybe spent an hour and a half doing that in an area and I've seen nothing, well, you know, life, life is short. You need to go on and do other things. But if I've watched for 90 minutes systematically it, with good optics and in good weather conditions and seeing nothing, well, then I'm reasonably confident I haven't missed too much. Uh, but of course, you know, we're sampling and of course you're always going to miss things. You can, as somebody once said to me, you can never record everything. Um, so I, I, I gather if you're you're looking for, you know, for, for prey up on a mountaintop and you've got gorse and you've got bushes and you've got hedges, uh, it probably requires, you know, a different sort of methodology because animals can go to ground. Uh, they might be feeding, they might be resting, and they could be in an undergrowth. Exactly. Or a- so is it is 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 with well watching also this thing that you you need to train your eye to actually understand what you see because uh, I and I shared this story like the first time when I was just starting to you know uh, trying to find a deer. And I was with the experienced hunter, right? And he, I just couldn't see the deer. I said like, oh, oh, there's a deer there, right? And I'm watching like, where, where, there. And I'm watching through my, looking through my bio, it's like, is, is, is that that pole? It's not a pole, it's a deer. Because I just, my brain did not know how it looks what I'm looking for. Is that the same thing with whale watching? That you need a certain, you know, you, you, you need to know how the whale looks like before you can, that the unexperienced whale watcher may just, you know, pan through the most obviously, you know, surfaced whale and never, never, never spot it? Or is it so obvious that that's not an issue? The, the, the cues, the field cues are, 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 can be very, very subtle. And, uh, and as well, the animals sometimes are on the surface very, very briefly, and they can be a long way away. So, so I, 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 I know bird watchers are always slagging whale watchers, and whale watchers are generally, well, I, I love slagging bird watchers as well. Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. Because what we do, we, we, we do it quite differently. But I remember as a, I, I, as a younger kid uh, going out to Cape Clear Island in West Cork, one of my favourite places on the planet to go whale watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember going out with some really seasoned birders. And um, a bit like your experience with the deer up on the mountaintop. And uh, these were guys who had lots of years. of These were gnarly old guys, but they had great optics. They've been coming out to Cape Clear for 30 or 40 years. Mm-hmm. And I, they, 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 you know, I was out as a young whale watcher. I, I was a bit of a novelty out in Cape Clear. Uh, so they said, well, come on up. We're, we're doing a sea watch. Come on up with us. And um, so I, I let them do their thing. And I sat a little bit behind them. And the watch was over a couple of hours later. We went back to the pub and we were having some Guinness. And I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Rick Mundy saying to me, well, wow, what, what did you think of those Rissos dolphins? And I'd never seen Rissos dolphins before. And I said, I, was, I, I didn't see them. And he held up three fingers and he said, Count how many fingers on my hand. I went, well, three. He said, well, okay, well, at least we know you're not blind. So he said, (laughs) there's something wrong there. So I then looked at my binoculars and I went home that time and I had a cheap pair of binoculars I got for $29.99 in Tesco's or something. And and from that day on, I said, right, this will never happen to me again. I will never be. I will never be. Uh, uh, be. Uh, <laughs> I will never be abused by birders uh, uh, like this again. But but Rick was right. He taught me a valuable lesson. You need to upgrade your optics, and of course, you need to spend more time in the field so that you can pick up on those subtle cues. And you know what? The the more you do something the better you get at it and the luckier you seem to get. Uh, so so, uh, so it, it, it is just a question of, of, of putting the time in and learning the subtle field cues. And, and those little cues will differ from site to site. And, um, you know, every, every headland or every bay has its own little nuances. And, and that's why we recommend it's better to watch systematically from one place because you become familiar with that place. You know, if you're going out uh, exactly. and you're, you're glassing for deer in the mountains and if you go to a different mountain range all the time, you're never going to get a feel for your site. You're never going to get a feel for the potential hotspots, for what way the wind works as it's blowing down the valley. All these things are important. Same with fishing, right? Same with fishing. Your fishing spot, your best fishing spot is the one that is closest to your home because you're most often there and you know 
what fish doing there and and so listen just to wrap up the part of the binoculars and watching and the optics and and all that two two final questions you mentioned that you're you're transitioning to the to the scope from binos if you don't find anything with the binos Th that that would be again different than what i was taught because it was like okay once you find something with the binos then you transition to the scope to kind of uh look into the detail what that is but you said like no if i don't see anything with the binos then i'm transitioning to the scope so is it like a mixture of both or like yeah well when you're when you're on land you can bridge that gap you know, you you can get closer if you're watching a deer. You can you can say, well, I see a deer over there. It's a kilometer away. I, I'm going to cut that distance down uh, to 500 meters. In which case, I don't need my 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 my, my spotting scope. I'm going to take out my binoculars. When you're whale watching, you, you you can't bridge that gap. So generally, animals uh, animals are generally quite far away. So my rule of thumb is usually I end up defaulting and doing my serious watching with a scope uh, gotcha. because you know the distances you need to bridge that distance and even with the most expensive with the best binoculars in the world you, you are going to struggle to look at those little subtle cues that distinguish say a common dolphin from a bottlenose dolphin or a harbour porpoise from a common dolphin mm -hmm. or a minky whale from a, or a big minky whale from a small fin whale and, and really you do need a scope for that so listen but it, it, mm. and of course when you're out in a boat well then it's completely different because oh, yeah. generally, generally if you're out in a boat well, you can't use a scope at all because there's mm -hmm. too much vibration on a boat yeah. and to be honest even, even out in a boat very few people end up using their binoculars after a while usually the advantage of being out in a boat is that you know you can get as close as you want whereas you can't do that from land you know yeah. but listen it's, it's, it's horses for courses but invest in as good a pair of optics as you possibly can and you cool. won't go far wrong so to wrap this thing up hit us with a with a few uh stats so what what binos would you use 54 by 10 would that be a kind of default uh, no, I, I I think you'll find that tens are w way too powerful. Uh, to, to me, you know, I, I I'd be using something like a a seven or eight times magnification. Um, you know, that's the you know you know you're looking at, you're looking for that ratio that's about four to uh, about four, a four to one ratio in terms mm -hmm. of you know you get those two numbers. Uh, so if you get a ratio of four to one, that's generally quite a good ratio. But mm -hmm. just you know, I I'd be always a little bit wary. If you you look at any of the really Really expensive binoculars like the Zeiss or the Leica or the Swarovski, any of these uh, top range, very few of them go up to 10 times magnification. Yeah. You find most of them, most of them are sevens or eights. The, the cheaper ones tend to make a big deal about being really, yeah, really yeah. big magnification. That sometimes worries me a little bit. Yeah. So, so eight by 54, that would be, it seems like an eights are like a, a jack of all trades as they're there because the field of view, because there's another thing that the field of view is wider with the lower magnification, which is which is important. Okay. Um, exactly. let's and field of view is really, really important. Yeah. In fact, field of view is is at least as important as magnification. Yes, absolutely. Uh, listen, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about actual cetaceans and, and the animals that this is all about. Um, first question, I need to start with that. How the hell did that happen? that the animals who are breathing air, mammals, ended up in the water and being like totally 100% adapted to the water. Yeah, I, I, I know this is a particular pet subject of yours, isn't it? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a question that, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the podcast is meant to be educational as well. And I think this is, this is something that I just can't, I feel like I cannot not mention when talking about whales. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a fascinating one. I mean, you think about 50 million years ago, you know, the, the world was a very different place to the one we have now. In fact, our waters were an awful lot shallower back then. Uh, you had an awful lot more, um, if you like, bays, shallow bays. You probably had an awful lot more lagoons. You had an awful lot more swamps. Um, and... Um, um, the likes of mangrove swamps, places like this. So you had an awful lot more shallow water. Our oceans weren't nearly as deep as they are today. Mm. So you had animals that spent very likely, very probably an awful lot more time quite habituated to 
to the coastal environments where they were quite used to getting their toes wet, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of, if you get a lot of prey items near these coastal lagoons, you obviously get quite a lot of predators as well. And at some point during the Eocene period, about 50 million years ago, the, the earliest living uh, sort of ancestors were... Were, were something that was probably quite closely related to the modern, um, you know, a small carnivore, mm -hmm. started moving more and more into these coastal lagoon type environments. And as you know, evolution takes place over many, it happens slowly over many, many millions of years. And those animals slowly morphed over the, the, the periods uh into a more aquatic animal. And of course, as this happened over the 40 million years, 30 million years, 20 million years ago, their bodies started to become completely adapted uh, to, to, to life in a, in a, in a, a semi-aquatic environment. And then ultimately, probably about 30 million years ago, to life in a fully aquatic environment. Uh, yeah. And it was only recently, back around uh, the early 1980s, with the, when they found fossils of, uh, was it Pakisethus mm -hmm. up in Pakistan, that yeah. they realized, well, this actually was the missing link between the the terrestrial sort of early ancestor and our modern whale. Uh, and and from that time on, you know, the animals got longer, they got more streamlined, their, their back legs became, if you like, disappeared. It's the old saying, if you don't use something, you lose mm -hmm. it. Uh, and if we found a fin whale on a beach, and we've done this before, uh, and, and you cut it up around its hind quarters, you will find the little vestigial limbs, these mm -hmm. remnant bones, which 50, 60 million years ago would have been the hind legs of this mammal. So they still exist, uh, these mm -hmm. vestigial limbs. Uh, and of course, their front legs morphed into these paddle-shaped, uh, what we call pectoral fins or flippers. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest adaptation, if you like, was that their breathing apparatus, if they were breathing still from the front of their face like we do, wouldn't make much sense if you were well on the evolutionary path to becoming a, a fully aquatic animal. So their breathing apparatus migrated to the top of their head. Uh, and that made it much, that, that made that, if you like, that change from uh, to coming up to the surface to breathe, the change from the aquatic to the terrestrial environment made that change, that switch over for breathing far more you know, far more sort of seamless transition uh, to so that they could, you know, they're still obviously air breathing mammals. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting one. And there's lots of still lots of missing pieces to that jigsaw puzzle as to how exactly and where and when these animals changed. But the early ancestors for today's modern whale was um, this small carnivore that was probably uh, 50 million years ago foraging around the edge of swamps. And, you know, maybe it was as simple as the competition got too tough uh, mm -hmm. and they realized, and this is always a biological fact, there will always be more food in our oceans yes. than there will ever be on land. So there was always that driver for these animals to head where the prey is. And uh, of course, nowadays, with, with, with what we're managing systematically to do to our oceans, you could, you could question that, whether there is more uh, food. But back then, certainly the driver was always the food is all out there in our oceans. Uh, and, and that was the driver for this movement from terrestrial uh, to, to the ocean. Yeah. And, and like you mentioned, the, the move of the, of, the, of the breathing apparatus is probably the most incredible uh, example of evolution and the most incredible adaptation. That like, whoa. Is it like, is it actually on the back of its skull? Is it... Not really. The, 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 the blowholes, which we call, <coughs> which we're yeah. referring to, and of course, with the toothed whales or the dolphins, they have a single blowhole, whereas with, with the large whales, bigger animals, they've got a pair, paired nostril or a blowhole. And it's kind of on, on, on top of their skull rather than being in the back of the skull. On top and of the skull. Mm top of the skull and uh, if if he probably weren't on Zoom or if I, if my office wasn't being knocked down I could take out a couple of schools and show them to you now but uh, mm -hmm. anyway it's all online <laughs> but uh, what, what it does is the fact that they can now breathe from the top of their skull minimizes their time they need to spend on the surface because if you're a, a whale or a dolphin 
That's when you're more vulnerable to attack from predators. Yeah. You're yeah. A dolphin or a porpoise, obviously the likes of sharks. You, you want to get kind of out of that area where, you know, you're because you're, you're not using your, your echolocation isn't working. You're, 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 you're you, you know, you're not seeing too well because your 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 head is out of the water. So you want to minimise that little short period, even though it's only a yeah a, a portion of a second. But that is when you're vulnerable. And if your breathing apparatus is is on the top of your head, that just means a very fast, smooth transition. Take a breath, exhale, take a breath, and down you go again for another couple of minutes. So you're minimising the risk of attack by predator with this evolutionary development of your breathing yeah. apparatus or your blowhole uh, being positioned on the top of your head. How what what species are and and how long because there are like a deep water species of whales. How long they can they can stay underwater without well breathing? Well, they're breathing in the sense that they have oxygen in their lungs and the, all the adaptations. But what is the in the in the, in case of deep water species time between the breaths or surfaces surfacing? Yeah, I I, I mean. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Um, typically, the likes of harbour porpoises, which is as our smallest whale, they would typically die for three or four minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, dolphins, you know, after about five or six minutes, they're gonna kind of gonna need to be up on the surface. Our regular whales that we see here, the longest they would typically die for. And the likes of our minkies, our humpbacks, or fin whales, if they're diving for 11, 12 minutes. <clears throat> That's mm-hmm. a deep dive. And then when they come up to the surface, they're going to spend a couple of minutes uh, and they might have a couple of shallow dives, maybe 30 or 40 seconds between dives. And then you might see a tail lift for a humpback whale. And that generally signals a deep dive. And that deep dive would be 12, 12 minutes kind of tops. Okay. Then you've got your, your deep diving whales that you alluded to. And these would be mm-hmm. typically Moby Dick, your sperm whale, mm-hmm. uh, is the classic, is the largest of our deep diving whales. You've got your likes of your pilot whales. Uh, and then you've got a, a family of six whales referred to as, uh, well, our beaked whales. We use six be- members of the beaked whales uh, in Irish waters. And these beaked whales, they're the real sort of Olympic champions of deep diving. It is thought that the likes of the Cuvier's beaked whale can dive for longer than two hours. Whoa! They, 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 they can dive to depths of three, 4,000 meters. Wow. Uh, so that is absolutely an incredible dive time. Uh, I'm recently reading a paper which suggested that they could potentially dive for two and a half, almost three hours. Uh, so uh, just don't even begin to ask me what sort of, uh, uh, you know, what sort of, uh, mechanisms they have for a mm-hmm. breath hold. I mean, I'm a great believer and follower of Wim Hof and his breathing mm-hmm. and his breathing method. But my God, holding your breath for, uh, for 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 even one hour is remarkable. But two to three hours seems Jeez. absolutely insane. But this is where their food is: the Cuvier's beaked whales, the Trues, the Gervais beaked whales, even the sperm whales. Their food is all deep. They they feed on cephalopods and squid and and deep diving species like this. So that's where they need to go. They have evolved for living life in the depths, and they've a couple of adaptations to facilitate this. Wow, uh, it is an amazing thing. And of course, for 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 whale watchers, they're a real nightmare because you know these are animals that spend you know sort of almost their entire lives at depth. So uh, when they come up to the surface, uh, uh, they that's your opportunity to see them because by the time they come back up to the surface after diving for hours, they're knackered. So they need to rest. So often when the likes of a sperm whale comes up mm-hmm. after a deep dive, it's it's exhausted. So you'll just see them logging there. Uh, okay. And then you know, they, they, they replenish their oxygen reserves and down they go again. The, the tail lifts up, they fluke, and they've got this enormous head which has mm-hmm. this if you like this, this organ in it, this, uh, this, this, this buttery type substance, uh, called, and this is why the old whalers call them sperm whales, because it looks. Mm. Well, you've got to use your imagination. It, it looks outwardly, perhaps like a, like like a certain sort of material that comes from one of our body orifices. Uh, but that 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 spermaceti organ, uh, uh, butter-like substance. As the whale's diving deeper and deeper, it's getting colder and colder, so it's getting heavier and heavier. So it's actually... At- behaving like a, a lead that's taking uh, him down. Like a free diver is going to put on a couple of uh, weight, weights on him just to t- help take him down. Uh, yeah. And 
And conversely, when he's coming back up, the water's getting warmer. That that butter-like substance is now beginning to to get lighter, and that's actually helping him, enabling him uh, rise up uh, slowly, but but surely up back up to the surface where he needs or she needs to take a breath. You you're explaining to me why it's called sperm whale now. I was wonder I was wondering that. Listen, man. Um, so that's interesting that you said that they knackered. So it's not like they're they're diving, they're taking the, the deep dive, and they go up and like, and off they go again. They, this is actually hard work for them to to stay that long and, and that deep. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of places in the world where, where there, there is whale watching based around sperm whales. And it's kind of places like the Kaikoura Canyon in New Zealand or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you need deep water to see, de- see these animals. And, yeah. you know, I, I, Ireland waters, you know, you have to go a long way out from the Irish coast before you get water that's suitable habitat for these animals. Mm-hmm. Because most of our water, like, you know, I uh, don't know where you are, Tommy, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm the Irish you're in Kerry, okay, well, the Irish Sea, the southwest of Ireland, from Kerry, you got to go out about 100 kilometers before you start getting to that zone. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you could be going out 10, 10 kilometers, 20, 50, even about 70, 80 kilometers, and the water is, like, quite steady. It's uh, what mm-hmm. we call uh, the the shelf, the continental mm-hmm. shelf. Yeah. It's kind of steady. It's 30, 40, 50 meters, sometimes a bit shallower, sometimes a bit deeper, but you've got to go out a long way until you hit this point where slowly it starts mm-hmm. to drop down. And it's along that shelf that, that slopes down. That's where you get to see your deep divers, the likes of your pile of whales, your sperm whales, your beaked whales. Uh, oh. and, uh, it, uh, and whale watching for them is quite different to whale watching for our shallow divers uh, that yeah. we have in more inshore waters. But I can imagine. I can imagine that. Listen, um, t- tell us, what's the difference between whales, dolphins, and purposes? Everybody knows that there's this this divide but are there any morphological you mentioned that the nostril that the whales have a double nostril rather but is there any other fundamental why yeah, they but, why they why they not all called whales why we even well, think well in, in actual fact they they are really all whales i mean they're, they're all members of the great whale family so even our smallest whale um which we call the harbor porpoise it's it's a member of the porpoise family like you know fungi is a bottlenose dolphin or if you go out into the dingle bay you'll, you can see hundreds of common dolphins or rissos dolphins they're they're in the dolphin family but but they are all in the order of cetacea so they are all if you like in the greater whale family uh, so our smallest whale I always tell people is a harbour porpoise or the Mukamara as they say in Irish or off the Kerry Gwert up there uh, closer to you out of Schleyhead and the Dingle Peninsula they have a wonderful name for them they call them Ontohinoch which translates as the wee fat fella so, so even though they're a harbour porpoise and they're like if they're a first cousin of the dolphins I still refer to them when I see a harbour porpoise I think oh there's Ireland's smallest whale because they are they're, they're members of the whale family uh, yeah. of which there's 85 recognised by science. And in Irish waters, we have recorded 25. So we've, 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 we've over one third of the world's species of, uh, of, 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 of great whales and, and not so great whales. So we have a very, very high species diversity. But just to come back to your question, mm-hmm. the, the using of size sometimes doesn't help because, you know, you've got whales, you've got dolphins. We tie porpoises on with, 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 with dolphins, although they're kind of, they are separate. And the reason they're separate is because of their tooth shape. So dolphins have sharp little cone-shaped teeth Whereas porpoises have what they call spatulas or little button mushroom teeth. And uh-huh. there's, there's six families of porpoises around the world. But in Ireland, we only have the one, the harbour porpoise. And they've got these small teeth. So in, in theory, uh, that is the diagnostic distinction between porpoises and dolphins. It's the shape of the teeth. The dorsal fins are also quite different. So then we move from the porpoises. Let's park them for a moment. Porpoises, Ireland's smallest whale, Ireland's smallest cetacean. Then you've got the dolphins. We've got about nine species of dolphins in Irish waters. Mm. Now, of those, two of them are interesting because we call them whales, pilot whales and killer whales. But they're not whales, strictly speaking. They're dolphins. They're the large, the killer whale is the largest member of the dolphin family. And the reason for that is simple. The distinction between a dolphin and a whale is determined by the location of its dorsal fin. So if the dorsal fin is centered midway on the back, it's a dolphin or a porpoise. If the dorsal fin is two thirds along the back, it's a whale. So for us, when we're whale watching, one of the first questions is, where is the dorsal fin? Because it tells us 
first of all, is it a dolphin or is it a whale? Uh, size isn't that useful because some dolphin species are bigger than lots of whale species. So, for instance, the killer whale is bigger than probably half the whale species on the planet uh, because all those beaked whales we talked about, they're much smaller than, than a big adult bull killer whale. So don't get caught up in size. Size doesn't actually help us determine. Now, of course, if you tell us you, you, you saw a whale and it was like 60 or it was 20 or 30 metres long, well, then clearly that's a whale. Uh, yeah. But sometimes you, if you're at, looking at animals in the 20 the 30 foot range and there's lots of them size doesn't help because it could be either a big dolphin or a small whale so we got to be careful there but technically that is the most useful diagnostic feature between a dolphin and a whale it's the location of the dorsal fin so with dolphins it's midway with whales it's two thirds along the back right right i presume that on the, on your website people can find a id guide so once they once they buy you know the that once they maxed out their budget uh to buy the optics and they they go somewhere uh to watch the dolphins and they make a note then they can come back to uh iwdg website and try to figure out what did they saw Yeah, well, I mean, we've got lots of interesting guides out there. Like, I mean, uh, we, I mean, the most useful one was the, uh, you know, is this little field guide, Whales and Dolphins of Ireland. Uh, you know, we also bring out publications like our magazine, uh, Flukes, which comes out to our members and is, is widely available. Oh, okay. Um, like, so that's know, one so of the benefits of being a member. You got the magazine. Yeah, yeah, you, you, we, we keep in regular contact with our members. But when you go online and you fill in a citing form, you know, you're, you're asked to think. Uh, you get an online version of this. You know, okay, for people who are only listening to that, uh, uh, Porig is showing like a casual citation citing form, which, you, which I can see shapes of the, of the fins and the shapes of the head that you can put the tick mark on it. And uh, show oh, wow the shape of the of the blow type of the blow scene whales only whoa so people who 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 listen to this you can go to YouTube and you can see that on the screen fantastic so so yeah so I mean there's lots of resources we've got small field guides small posters we've got large format posters just to help people with that thorny issue of species ID but if you you think about it if if you're a if if you're a bird watcher you know there's there's over 10,000 species of birds oh around. yeah I don't even want to go. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> You know, if, if you're a whale watcher, there's only 85 species of whales, dolphins or porpoises in the world. You know, so, so I mean, I, bringing it to an Irish context, I think there's been about 400 different bird species recorded in Ireland. We've yeah. only recorded 25 species of whales and dolphins. So the birders, in fairness to them, they will always say that we have it quite easy in terms of that thorny issue of species identification. Uh, because by dint of the fact that we've relatively few actual species uh, and and, and the right of course you know we would say well there's sometimes there's a high difficulty factor in identifying these species because they're far out to sea and because they they spend 98 of their lives below yeah. the surface uh, yeah. but yeah no so i mean the key is as always it's become familiar with the common stuff uh, the harbor porpoises the, the the dolphins the minke whales and then the less common stuff the more unusual stuff will will with time the more you watch will start to fall into place yeah you you at least you can notice that this is not something that you commonly see and they're like oh what's that i this is not the purpose or something like Uh, a very a, extremely interesting. Listen, uh, we 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 slowly uh, starting to run uh, out of time, but I have a few more few more for you. Um, what would you? What are the? What are the advice or or rules um, that you would like to uh, share with us for people who has perhaps their their owners of a small boat and they're going out there, um, you know maybe inspired by this podcast what are the do's and don'ts of whale watching when you're on the boat or you know a a inflatable or anything like that 
Yeah, well, the, we, we work very closely with the Department of the Marine and the National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group did back in uh, 2005. And be, between us, we, with some guidance from operators as well, uh, we put together um, a, a marine notice called Marine Notice 15, uh, wh- which is a fairly comprehensive document that takes a fairly common sense approach as to how both operators, both commercial and private, need to behave when they are in the company of whales. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's called Marine Notice 15. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's not a voluntary code of conduct. It's a statutory instrument. So it's actually enforceable by law. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody who has a boat, who is in particular, who has gone out with the express intention of looking for whales and dolphins, needs to be mindful of that, both to protect the animal's and themselves already this this year we've seen video footage uh, of, of 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 I'm not going to say what I think of them but pe- people hmm. being a little bit cavalier around whales uh, and around not observing what the whales are doing uh, there was one case where an angler was out in a boat and he was so focused it seems on 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 on, on, on getting what seemed to be a selfie of himself uh, and this whale that the whale ended up hitting the boat and he ended up in the water now thankfully thankfully everything went up yeah it's funny it, it is funny but it could have been a mortality it could have been somebody who ended up drowning and of course then everybody would be clamoring oh these whales are dangerous you know whales aren't dangerous some people are just stupid. Uh, so, so to be mindful of the fact that that was a minky whale, had that been sort of, a, instead of being a 25-foot minky whale, had that been a, a 45-foot humpback or a 75-foot 22-metre fin whale, the second biggest animal on the planet, the outcome could have been quite different. We, we've seen in the last couple of weeks video pictures taken from a whale-watching boat of people in West Cork trolling for bluefin tuna, trolling right through a bait ball of sprat where there was a humpback whale on it. And they're bringing in, you, you see the teaser lures out there which have no hooks in them, but then you see the hooks being, the, the, the lure with the hook being brought in and it missing a whale by inches. Now, you're not going to foul hook a humpback whale, but you, that whale could quite easily have ended up getting wrapped around that. And, and, and that wire on a bluefin tuna lure you know, would be like cheese wire, could easily cut through a whale's yeah. pectoral fin. Uh, so we're just asking people to, to adopt a certain amount of common sense, that these are large animals, and although they're benign, every year accidents do happen, and they're complete, in a lot of cases, they, they are unnecessary accidents. So just be respectful of the fact, and, and know that there is a statutory instrument, Marine Notice 15, 2005, which prohibits people uh, on any boat from from sort of from from behaving in a way I such as for instance people on boats swimming with whales completely illegal in Irish waters boats traveling uh, getting way too close say more than closer than a hundred meters of whales uh, boats crossing the path of whales boats spending longer than 30 minutes with whales all, all of these are sort of useful guides uh, that people need to be mindful of and again it's not only to protect the, the whales it's to ensure and to minimise uh, the, the the risk of accidents uh, and interactions that go pear shaped between whales and people, because that is going to be a growing area. You know, as whale watching is growing year on year, and more and more boats are seeing that. You know, our seas are becoming sort of worse and worse in terms of they're becoming, uh, you know, less good for angling and deep sea angling. More of these boats are looking to whale watching as a way to diversify, and there's going to be more pressure uh, on these whales uh, because there's going to be more but ju- just look what's happening in Kerry now in recent years you know all the, the you know the, the the fungi boats in Dingle were starting to see the, the writing on the wall with fungi's behaviour and that he was getting old they're all now starting to go out into Dingle Bay on their fast ribs which have potential great potential to disturb whales because they're so fast they're so manoeuvrable they can get the whales very quickly so Irish Whale and Dolphin Group thinks it's fantastic that people are whale watching out on boats, but we need to be mindful of the potential for disturbance to the animals. And if we keep disturbing whales uh, when they're coming to these rich feeding areas off the southwest of Ireland, places like West Kerry and West Cork, those whales will vote with their fins and they will just move to other feeding areas. And that would be an awful shame. So let's not sort of, you know, kill the goose that lays the golden egg by, 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 by behaving badly around these animals.
Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it's it's good to know. Marine Marine North is fifteen. Is it also on your website, or is it something that people just yeah. need to? Oh, it, it is. It's... Yeah, Marine North is fifteen is on our website, but it's also on the Department of the Marine website, mm -hmm. uh, and they're fairly common sense. Well, one key one is not to swim with these animals. I, I, I know people see footage all the time of people swimming with animals in the in the tropics. And they're in the tropics because they're breeding areas. They, they're, they're nursery areas for mothers mm -hmm. uh, who are pregnant and they're giving mm -hmm. birth. And once the birthing takes place, they spend their time. In, but up at these latitudes are here to feed. So the whales are generally very active and you don't want to get caught in a small boat in the middle of a bait ball that's got two or three humpback whales bubble netting. Or, uh, uh, you know, uh, yes. it, 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 it's, a, it's a, you know, what happens at high latitude feeding grounds is, is a very, very different to what happens on, on tropical breeding grounds. Don't confuse the two. Right, that's a that's a very important thing because a lot of people see in this uh, GoPro commercials with uh, ladies in bikinis swimming with waves. Like, oh, I want it like that as well, but that's a that's a different that's a different story. Listen, uh, just to just to um, uh, is it is it worth mentioning? What are the most popular? It's probably worth mentioning. What are the most common commonly seen whales and dolphins in, in Irish waters? We, we probably mention them. Every year, the most commonly seen whale in Irish waters is the harbour porpoise. And the wonderful thing about porpoises is you can see them anywhere. You know, you, mm. People report, even this morning, we had sightings of uh, harbour porpoises reported to the Irish Whale and Dolphin from Dunleary Pier this morning. Mm. Uh, they can be seen in almost any stretch of water. Our most common dolphins pretty much every year are common dolphins, as the name suggests, uh, along the north coast and along, say, the western seaboard, bottlenose dolphins would be reported more frequently. Um, in fact, the east coast in the Strangford Lock has a new solitary bottlenose dolphin. They call them fin there. So that's he's a really interesting one. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're bottlenose dolphins. Uh, as you kind of go, uh, then as you move offshore, you get other species of dolphins. But just focusing on what people might see, so you've got harbour porpoises, common dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, occasionally Rissos dolphins, places like Wexford, the Salties, great place to see Rissos, the Blaskets off West Kerry, great place to see Rissos dolphins, but they can turn up uh, uh, pretty much anywhere, but infrequently, but they are out there. Mm -hmm. Then as you go up to the whales, our most frequently seen whale that can be seen increasingly in all Irish waters is the minke whale. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even this year off Hoth Head in Dublin, there were um, aggregations of as many as eight minke whales. But, you know, there, there are times I was going out on a local whale watching boat here this summer with the likes of Colin Barnes here from Union Hall. Ah. And, uh, yeah, and we, we counted on, on consecutive days. And I know Nick Massett in, in, in West Kerry there off the Blaskets had similar encounters where days when he went out and recorded areas where there was rich feeding, sand eels, maybe sprats, and we were counting 40, 50 upwards of 60 minke whales in one area. And of course, when you get that many whales uh, feeding loosely in a wide area, odds are you're going to have humpback whales in there amongst them as well. Oh. Uh, and then right now, I would say, if you were to ask me right now, at this point in time, where's the best place to see, see whales? I would say the second largest whale on the planet, the fin whale, is now being seen fairly regularly along the Waterford coast. So if you're down more off the Celtic Sea area, along the south coast, rather than the southwest, I'd be saying go out to places like Hookhead and Wexford, uh, Tremor, Brownstown, Anstown Head, Helvick Head, any of these places uh, in, on, on, on good weather like we have today and tomorrow, actually. And I know this isn't going out live, so it's unfortunate. But any time from now up to Christmas, even into January, January, uh, the Waterford, even the Wexford coast can be among the best places to see the planet's second biggest whale, the mighty fin whale. And they were called the greyhounds of the sea by the old whalers because they were so fast. The, old, the early whalers couldn't catch them. So we've got a great, so we, we have what we call these usual suspects and they are harbour porpoise, common bottlenose dolphins, rissos dolphins, minke whale, humpback whale and fin whale. So you've got about those eight species. Sure. Uh, and, and anything after that, it, it tends to be more rare. But we have up to 25 species recorded. And in a typical year here in Ireland, uh, an average year, we would usually document 11 or 12 species every year. And of course, then you have your extra rare animals that have just been recorded once or twice. Like, you know, uh, we had the bowhead whale, which is an Arctic species turn up mm -hmm. uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, every decade or so, 
we have beluga whales turn up, we have walruses mm-hmm. turn up every four or five years. So we always get these, what you call these extra limited vagrants, and mm-hmm. you never know where or when they're going to turn up. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Listen, uh, just to uh, finish it off, I know that the strandings is, is not, you're, you're having like a separate uh, kind of area uh, on strandings, but, but since I have you here, um, the question I have is, is stranding of, of dolphins or, or whales, is it something that, um, it's, a, it's a strange question a little bit, but I'm going to ask anyway, is it something that happens naturally? Or is it is the stranding always a site of something wrong happens, right? There is a seismic testing going on somewhere. There is a fishing fleet uh, somewhere. There's something wrong going on. And that's why we see strandings. Or is stranding something that could, you know, happen naturally? The dolphin is old and it dies and it gets washed off the beach and, and you know. Yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I, I remember about uh, 10 years ago, a fin whale live stranded in a, in Cork McSharry Bay in, in West Cork. And it, it, it stranded next to a farmer's land. And the farmer, we, we had vets and Cork County Council down and we had, you know, film crews. It was nuts. But the farmer was talking to me about it and he was really interested in it. And he was asking me how unusual it was. And I was explaining a bit about the biology and ecology of fin whales. And he paused for a moment and he went, mm, okay. He says, so... As a farmer, all I can say is when I've got livestock, I've got dead stock. One is one is a factor of the other. And I just thought that was brilliant. When I, you know, So when you have healthy populations, you're going to have a mortality event. Every year, uh, a percentile of that population is going to die. Mm-hmm. So it, we can't say that, of course, that every, every, every stranding has something sinister underpinning it. I mean, the famous, the first ecologist known to science was uh, a character in ancient Greece called Pliny the Elder. And he wrote about mass strandings of, of dolphins in the Aegean Sea 2,000 years ago. So that was before uh, shell oil or marathon or, or oil exploration or seismic surveys. And that was long before military or navies used low-frequency active sonar. So this is something that always has happened. Mm-hmm. It's the rate at which it's happening now uh, it does give us great cause for concern. And, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, so, so that, um, but that is why the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group record these strandings. Like, it's very clear, uh, looking at even a cursory glance of the data, that we have an unacceptable carnage out at sea of the likes of our most common dolphin, the, the short yeah. the common dolphin. There, they, is a, they, there is an article on your website called Carnage of Common Dolphins. Yeah, and it's been going on for 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 many years, and uh, and and this is why the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is is has been putting pressure on the government to to deliver a necropsy scheme, and we've had a limited necropsy scheme. It's not running now at the moment, but it meant that we could actually retrieve these dolphins off the beaches when they were in good enough condition, when they were dead in good enough condition, we could carry out uh, working alongside colleagues in in the regional vet labs and the Marine Institute and the National Parks and Wildlife. Service. Service, uh, we, 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 we could use pathologists to actually give us the cause of death of these animals. Uh, and I, it, it, that is important work. It needs to be done. Uh, and it's that sort of the evidence from that, you know, gives, you know, really needs to be used to, to actually try and sort out this problem because, mm-hmm. they, you know, it, what we're seeing washing up on our beaches is only a small percent, uh, probably about 10%. If, so if you took a thousand dolphins and, and threw them off a back, dead off the back of a trawler, you'd probably record about a hundred, if you tag them, you, you put mm-hmm. bits of gold thread around their tail stocks, uh, you, you might record about 10% of them. So of these animals that die at sea, only a fraction of them are washing up on our beaches. So, yeah. so and the record Recording scheme doesn't even pick up on all of those. It might only be recording, you know, 20 or 30 percent of these animals that wash up. So, again, we're only sampling. But but if you extrapolate, you know, the percentages of these animals that are getting caught in nets or dying at sea because of some anthropogenic or man-made cause uh, and the percentage of those that die at sea and sink to the seabed where they're just consumed by all these sort of little uh, benthic invertebrates, well, then we're, we're actually only getting a tiny part 
part of the actual carnage that's out there. But that's why this this work is really, really important. Uh, And it it is a little bit frustrating that every year, especially from now over the winter months, it's just almost, it seems, every week there's just dolphins washing up uh, on our beaches. And it was never always like that. This is a relatively new thing. And it's something that Mick O'Connell, our stranding coordinator from Kerry, has 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 been at pains to point out year in year out it is getting worse year in year out we are killing or more and more of these dolphins are dying accidentally in 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 our fishing gear uh, and something seriously needs to be looked into it uh, that's unfortunate listen uh, tell me about the live strandings because what i know is that you know so maybe a question is like when when is when it is practical to try to refloat stranded whale uh because as far as i know like from my very you know like a casual and and anecdotal knowledge is that quite often the the refloated whales they're they're going ahead and stranding themselves anyway uh you know later or or a couple of kilometers or, or a few you know kilometers away as if something is wrong with them that like they they just do it just, they just do this like almost like they want to uh commit suicide And I remember it was an incident a couple of months ago where some beaked whales were washed off the, off the beach uh, in, in Ireland. And uh, did you remember the name of this? this were they? These are northern bottlenose whales and northern, in, in Donegal. Northern bottlenose whales, yes. And there was a, a subsequent uh, incident in the same time in Feroz as well the same species that rarely happens they all they they they're deep diving ways they are they all of a sudden stranded themselves it was life stranding and um you know what was unfortunate is like i noticed that you guys took a lot of slack from some people like oh why are you not refloating them you should do this you should do that right so people who have very little very limited knowledge they had a very strong opinions of what you should do as an expert, oh, you should reflow, you should do, you should do this, you should do that. And, uh, you know, to me, even, you know, I'm not pretending to be in any sort of a non-casual or, or informed, but it was like, well, if these whales are this big, deep water species ended up here, it's like, it's like no way, like how would you refloat them? Is it even possible? So can you elaborate a little bit on the live stranding and whether to refloat or not and whether it even makes sense? The, the, the first thing we, we notice when we have a, a, a live stranding is that you, you, the trolls are going to come out very, very quickly uh, and they're going to start, you know, you know, slinging mud at us because we haven't done A, B or C or X, Y and Z. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you just got to let the keyboard warriors do their thing. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we as, as a young man, I, I organized the first live stranding workshop in Ireland. We brought over British divers, marine life rescue to Dolly Mount Strand in Dublin. We had inflatable whales. We did the, we had the rescue pontoons. Yeah. We, we did all that. We trained people up and we're still doing it. The, the reality is that in the vast majority of incidents, uh, you know, well, let's look at strandings first of all. 95, 96% of strandings are dead animals. Mm-hmm. So live strandings are about 3-4% of strandings every year are live stranding events. Mm-hmm. Of those, 95% of those very few live strandings are solitary animals. So you've got one animal washes up on the beach and it's still alive. Mm-hmm. The prognosis for survival of that animal is, in our experience of nearly 30 years being involved with strandings, is very, very slim. There is very little evidence and there are very few cases. And we have put an awful lot of dolphins back into the water. You will always give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, where possible and where you're not making it dangerous for people, you will try and refloat these animals by putting them back into the water. And as you, as you say, we've got a lot of experience of doing that. And we've an awful lot of experience of watching those whales swim out of the bay and everybody has a happy, clappy, feel-good moment, and you have a barrel, or you go to the pub, and you have a pint, and you think to yourself, my God, you've got that warm, wuzzy feeling inside you that tells you you've gone and you've done something right, and you've, you, you've done something good, and then 
Two hours later, your phone goes on to say the dolphin's back in the beach again. And that's happened to us way too many times, Tommy. We've seen this happen time and time again. Uh, so maybe we've just got a little bit cynical with our old age. But you know what? Putting these animals back into the water generally is not the best thing to do. Uh, and, and people won't accept that. And that's fine. And, you know, uh, we were interested with the, these northern bottlenose whales and Ross Nowla. In fairness, the vast majority of the commentary was very, very positive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we try and say to people is there's a difference between doing nothing and an informed do nothing. There's a completely yeah. different thing. Yes. Uh, if you've done nothing because you understand the ecology and the biology of these whales that should be 100 kilometers out at sea, driving to 2,000 meters, and your suggestion is to, to tie a lasso around their tail with a tractor and drag it out into two feet of water after you've dislocated all its vertebrae uh, and you've stressed the animal even more, just so that you can say, well, I've tried to refloat the whale. You know, that we're not going to do that. Uh, and we would rather take the flak uh, t- t- to do the wrong thing. And, and some Sometimes doing nothing, in fact, often doing nothing um, with respect for the animal's welfare is, is the best course of action. Just And if it's, you know, a healthy whale would not be in Ross Nowla Strand, especially a healthy northern bottlenose whale. Yes. So th- th- that is now our, our kind of starting point, is that if this animal was healthy, it probably wouldn't be here in the first case. So in a lot of cases, these animals look quite thin. They look emaciated. They're rehydrated. It, 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 it's not very obvious to people. Well, you know, most whales just like, you know, health, you know fat and rotund. But we look at these whales and we say, well, well you know, this, this whale looks in poor condition. Its breathing is, it, it would, would suggest that it's very, very stressed. Uh, and, and we often assess the situation first when we go on site. And then, then after that, you're, you're really looking at palliative care in a lot of cases, just letting Mother Nature run its course yeah. uh, and, and for these animals to expire. But, you know, the, you know, there are very few good days in the office when it comes to stranding events, especially mm. live stranding events, because they're stressful for everybody. They're stressful for the onlookers looking on who've never seen this before. They're stressful for maybe the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group volunteers who turn up, and this is the last thing they need after a busy day at work doing their own or, or, or life. All of a sudden, they've got a stressful situation uh, where where, you know, where the water is freezing cold and they're supposed somehow to rescue a whale that weighs, even a small whale will weigh five tons or more, you know. Um, so it, it is a really, really difficult and challenging situation. Now, there are places in the world where this happens more regularly, places like, you know, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Sri Lanka has a mass stranding this morning of 100, uh, again, oh. same species, pilot whale, white whales. But in some of these places... It happens systematically. It happens more often. It's part almost of an annual cycle. And in places like this, it is possible to build up a a reaction to these events. But in, in, in Ireland, what we have is, you know, something you can train these volunteers and these agencies up and then it may not happen again, happen again in that local area for another 30 or 40 years. So yeah. all your training doesn't really count for every time it happens. You're starting right ab initio, right from the beginning uh, where people don't really know what to do because the people you've trained have moved on or they've died or something like that. But it's very difficult to legislate for an event which is an inherently rare event that yeah. may only happen, if at all, once in your lifetime. And that, is the, and, and that is the problem. It requires huge resources, huge logistics, neither of which are generally available. And of course, the bigger the whale species becomes, the more difficult that gets. And when you've got mass strandings, well, then everything becomes exponentially more difficult because, you know, the ratio, if you've got one whale or dolphin in the water that's stranding, you need about eight people to properly nurture that animal. But if you've got a dozen animals, well, then you need hundreds of people. And, uh, you, know, for half the, you know, for half the year in Ireland, if you spend more than 10 or 15 minutes uh, in the water, you're going to die of hypothermia. So, you know, in effect, you know, what you can do in most circumstances is extremely limited. So often simply dragging the animal back into the water because it makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah. It's just the wrong reason to be doing it. You're not doing it. It's a torturing of the animal rather than doing good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, what you, what you said, like, is it, if you have a, volunteers in the area and you're a volunteer is it is it happening like all of a sudden your phone rings and someone says like hey dude there is a live strand there's a stranding near you we need you there and you kind of going is that how it works 
Yeah, well, our stranding coordinator would, would usually ring around to see who's available. We'd, we'd network. We'd try and get the agencies involved. Uh, you know, and you know, the, the most relevant agency would be the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, we've always had a little bit of an issue with strandings and the National Parks and Wildlife Service because they would say, in their defence, they would say that these issues are welfare issues. They don't do welfare. Hmm. The National Parks and Wildlife Service are not a welfare organisation. Yeah. Their, con- their, their, their brief is conservation at population level. So they, they kind of rely a little bit heavily on that and say, sorry, uh, guys, you know, uh, we can't put our, our rangers in the water because it's, it, it's welfare. So you, you're always going to have this, this dichotomy between welfare and conservation. But to us, you know, if you've got a rare species of, of beaked whale, like the northern bottlenose whale, and you've got seven or eight of them on a beach, well, to us, that's a significant number of whales. So at, at some point, welfare does actually start to overlap with conservation. With conservation. Um, so, so we think it's important that, you know, the state agency with responsibility for wildlife actually, you know, rolls up their, 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 their waders a little bit and becomes more actively involved. Because at the end of the day, the Irish Whale and Duffer Group is a largely voluntary organisation. And these, we, these keyboard warriors and trolls who start hurling insults at IWDG because we don't save every whale that, um, that, that strands, you know, they, they've got to know that they're dealing with uh, um, sort of almost, you know, individuals at the end of the day who have almost no resources uh, to, yeah. to, to rescue large whales, to refloat large whales, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a tricky one. And as I said earlier, when it comes to li- live strandings of cetaceans, there are very few good days in the office. They, they do yeah. generally, I mean, in, in our minds, a live stranding is almost always a, a dead animal that just hasn't died yet. It just yeah. doesn't quite know it. And Tommy, in the same way, you know, if you go to an end of a pier, say you're having a bad day and say, oh, I'm going to end it all. I, uh, and, and you get half a dozen concrete blocks and you tie them to your feet and you throw yourself off the pier. <laughs> you know what the likely outcome of that event is. Mm-hmm. You, you, it's it's going to go one way for you, Tommy. Mm-hmm. Uh, likewise, a whale that is a completely aquatic animal. You've got to say, if that whale strands itself repeatedly, it's an intelligent, smart, sentient marine mammal. And on some level, it has got to know that oh, there's cool. a likely outcome of this. Uh, so who is to say that are intervening and simply continually throwing these, are pulling these, dragging these animals back into the water is not the diametric opposite to what this whale actually wants or needs. Mm-hmm. You're, you're kind of playing God with wildlife. And that, that's, yeah. that's, you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation there. Mm-hmm. So sometimes leaving Mother Nature run its course, because this has always happened. Whales, as I said, Pliny the Elder wrote about this in the Aegean Sea 2,000 years ago. It is not a new thing. And it is one of the great mysteries of wildlife. Why do whales strand and mass strand in particular? And, you know, there's no evidence that mass strandings are really happening more frequently, but every year they do happen. And uh, we are looking for a, a more coordinated response. And it is something that the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is mindful of. Uh, and it would be good to get more, more buy-in from the state agencies as well, because, you know, th- th- this is a, a multi-agency approach is needed to, to help, especially when it comes to these big whales. You, you, you know, if a fin whale turns up on your local beach, you're never going to save it, but it, it's about managing it, managing expectations from people and making sure that the whale is allowed to pass to the other life, if you like, uh, in, in, a, in a peaceful and without that sort of stress of people pulling and poking at it and dogs yeah. biting at it. Just to give the animal the respect in, and, and to allow the animal to die. As a species, we seem to have a terrible problem with death. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, nobody dies anymore. God, we, we're going through a global pandemic. It's amazing. And very, very few people are actually dying. God, even during a pandemic, it seems, uh, we, we can save almost everybody. But, but we do need to start looking at, at these animals. You know, death is a part, part of life. And, and, and not feel that somebody has failed because we can't rescue these animals when a whale turns up on your local beach. That's a, that's absolutely true. That's that's absolutely true, uh, Porik. Uh, I presume that for that the trainings for, like you mentioned, the tr- you know sort of a trainings that you're still running are available for for members. So uh, all they need to do is to enroll. Uh, they get a fantastic magazine, and then they can avail for all those trainings, right? And and perhaps they can yeah. they can help. 
when we're not in uh, global pandemics, during a normal year, we would run uh, whale, whale and dolphin rescue training courses. It's a one-day uh, volunteer. You don't have to be a member. They're designed for members oh. of the public uh, who can turn up uh, for a small fee, usually 20, 30 euros, and do a day's training with us. We'll show you how to use the rescue. We have these inflatable whale, pile of whale models that we use. we show you how to use the rescue pontoons uh, and how to lift whales properly or use the tarpaulins to get animals back into the water and how to care for them. Of course, it's not just a question of throwing an animal back into the water. You've got to care for that animal uh, that, because, you know, if it's been up on a beach or up on rocks for uh, for, for hours, it, you know, if you put it back into the water, it's just going to drown. So uh, it's about the aftercare of the animal once it's put back into the water. So mm-hmm. it's all covered in these courses that we run. And hopefully once we're out of this COVID, uh, we, we'll be able to run these, uh, these, these whale rescue courses again. Okay, fantastic. Listen, uh, any final word for, for our listeners who are, you know, absorb this uh, huge, huge amount of information about whales and uh, Irish whales and dolphin group? Any final word? Well, you know, I, I, you know, as, as a kid growing up, you know, I, I used to read Moby Dick and watch the movies. And, I, you know, I never believed that we, we could have, you know, we had this amazing wildlife on our doorsteps. And you know what? Most people are still completely unaware of it. And it, it amazes me, you know, and my colleagues in the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, no matter how many times there's a whale story or a dolphin story in the news, people go, God, I had no idea there were whales or dolphins in Irish waters. You know, it, it does amaze us. But we have it out there. Uh, and, and let's just, Keep an eye on our oceans. I mean, it's not a finite resource. Our, 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 our oceans, um, you know, we, we can very quickly deplete fish stocks. We need to look after the forage fish, in particular, these small fish like sprats and sand eels, that at the moment, it seems the Irish fishing industry is hell-bent on catching as many of them as they can so that we can process them into fish meal to feed salmon in cages in Norway and Spain. So that sort of that sort of ecological sort of uh, massive mass- of our seas has to stop. We have to look at a, at, a, at, a, at a more sustainable way of fishing, especially in our inshore coastal waters. And that will benefit everybody, not just the big boat owners, but the small coastal fishermen, the anglers, the way those involved in marine tourism and coastal communities. So let's look after, the, let's learn from the mistakes of the past, because the worst thing we can do is keep fishing down and down the food chain till we start catching the sprat and the sand eels that feed everything else in the ocean. So it's about looking, uh, just taking a bigger perspective. We need to be wary of our fish stocks. They are not a finite resource. And at the moment, we are in a very, very dangerous place. So if anybody from the fishing industry, think about your children and your grandchildren. If they want to have a career fishing, they need to start protecting the small fish, the forage fish, the sprat, the sand eels, the sorries, those, and stop processing them for fish meal. If, if I had one message for the day uh, that people could, could could take on. It's it's to look at our fish stocks and in particular our forage fish, those small little fish which commercially seem unimportant but ecologically are absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a powerful message, Porik. Listen, thank you very much for, for your time. Appreciate uh, everybody who's listening to that or watching should immediately go to Irish Whale and Dolphin Group website uh, and roll. Um, support your work. You, you, I think you're doing fantastic work and it, it, it's great that there are people like you guys who are uh, doing what you're doing and citizen science, everybody involved. Uh, if you spend the time, uh, I, I, um, listen, I might say, I'm going to take my binos and we'll go to the, you know, uh, exposed uh, piece of land and just watch and see if, what I can see because it's, it seems very, very interesting. Uh, Borek, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Tommy.